Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I'm Nina Shea. I direct the Center for Religious Freedom here at the Hudson Institute, where I'm a senior scholar. And I am uh, very, very honored today to be introducing my friend, my uh, a co-author on many articles, um, and um, part of the Hudson extended family, Faranaz Ispahani. And more than anything else, she is a very brave voice. Um, Farah is a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington. Uh, she uh, also served as a member of parliament in Pakistan and was media advisor to the president of Pakistan from 2008 to 2012. And in parliament, she focused on uh, terrorism, human rights, gender rights, gender-based violence, minority rights, uh, U.S.-Pakistan relations, and of course, uh, freedom of religion and freedom of expression. She was also a member of the Women's Caucus in the, ninth, in the 13th National Assembly. And she spent her formative years as a um, print and television journalist. She has um, worked in a number of different outlets, including some little ones like CNN and ABC News and MSNBC. And most, uh, her last journalistic post was as executive producer and managing editor um, of Voice of America's Urdu television. And today we are celebrating the publication of um, Farah's new book, Purifying the Land of the Pure, A History of Pakistan's Religious Minorities. And we, as you can see, we have it for sale um, over in the corner after the event today. Um, it recently won, it's an extraordinary book. It's meticulously uh, chronicled about um, the uh, tragic descent of Pakistan from being um, uh, a, a very hopeful formative period where the um, founding father, Jinnah, said, um, that there would be uh, open, it would be open regardless of caste or ethnicity or religion, and talked about, stressed the importance of about how religion would not be part of the government. This was not a business of the government, and um, how it's uh, really traveled in a very different trajectory since then. And really her, um, her chapter, titles sort of give a hint about what that uh, journey has been for Pakistan. Um, the ideological state, militarism and national identity, Islamization, global jihad and minorities, militarism, terrorism, and sectarianism. So um, Farah um, knows this extremely well. She grew up there. Her grandfather was one of the founding fathers, M.A.H. Ispahani. He was one of these um, open-minded, idealistic um, uh, uh, founders of an open state, of an, a, a secular state for Pakistan. And he was also the first ambassador to the United States. Um, I say that, uh, I, well, it has, it's, a, it's a wonderfully um, readable book, important book, Lessons for Our Times, and it recently won just last month the German Peace Prize at the Karachi Literary Festival. Um, it was sponsored by the German government. Um, it is, the book itself has not been able, she has not been able to find a, a publisher in Urdu. And it is not, uh, it's hard to find in Pakistan, let's say. Um, and uh, we probably would not be having this discussion in Pakistan. So uh, that's why I say that she is a brave voice. And she is part of our extended family um, in, in another way. Her husband is Hussein Haqqani, who is a senior fellow here and directs the uh, uh, South and Central Asia program for Hudson Institute. And he was ambassador from Pakistan to the United States as well, and he is with us today too. So join me in welcoming Farah while she presents the book.
Hi. Um, can you all hear me? I think so, yeah. Good morning. Um, I'd like to start by saying thank you to the Hudson Institute and also to my friend and guide, Nina Shea, for hosting this event today. Hudson and Nina have stood by my husband and I through the weakest times, and I'm very proud to be standing here doing something I feel um, will hopefully have a positive impact. Thank you so much, Nina and Hudson. Um, I'm going to start with laying out what my book is about and um, some details about the history and what has happened to religious minorities in Pakistan, but i just throw a number out at you. Um, around the time that Pakistan was being, uh, was being created in 1947, religious minorities were about 23%, which is almost a quarter of the population. Today, that number is closer to 3%. So I will explain in some detail how that has happened. Um, the mistreatment or marginalization of ethnic and religious minorities is becoming a global phenomenon. Demagogues are generating hatred for the other in the United States, Europe, and all over the Middle East. Attacking minorities is for some a way to garner support of a strong faction within the majority. Communal majoritarianism serves as a distraction from social and economic problems. In some cases, it is argued that only the creation of a purer society, purer in ethnicity or religious composition of a society, would somehow enable a nation to overcome its problems. The end result, however, is the same everywhere. Violence against minorities is unleashed, causing great human suffering. As a human rights activist, I have been concerned about the treatment of religious minorities in my country, Pakistan. My book is an attempt to explain why Pakistan's minorities feel insecure and how the desire of some to make Pakistan the land of the pure in the strictest sense, has resulted in the diminishing of the number of minority citizens and also the limiting of their rights. The title of my book, um, Purifying the Land of the Pure, is actually plays on the name Pakistan because Pak means pure and Stan means the land of. So it's literally the purifying of the land of the pure. Pakistanis in recent years seem to be becoming more aware of the fact that the world sees Pakistan as insecure for religious minorities. After years of just appealing to majority sentiment, Pakistan's leaders are now engaging in symbolic gestures of concern for minorities as well. In 2015 and 2016, several such positive gestures were prominently displayed in Pakistan, Political leaders from various parties, the PPP, PMLN, and MQM participated in Diwali. Plans to renovate one of the oldest temples in Pakistan were announced. On Christmas, Muslim politicians showed up at Christian celebrations to show solidarity with Pakistan's Christians. The Abdus Salam Physics Center was dedicated recently to Pakistan's only science Nobel laureate, who was an Ahmadi and who was not honored in Pakistan previously <laughs> and throughout his life solely on account of his religion. It appears as though rising violence against minorities has finally led to some pushback from civil society and ordinary Pakistanis but the extremist wave has not subsided. Christians still continue to be charged with blasphemy. One high-profile case is that of Asya Bibi, an unlettered Christian woman who was accused of blasphemy after being involved in an argument with a group of Muslim women with whom she had been picking berries. Last December, Asya Bibi spent her seventh Christmas in prison after a judge abruptly refused to hear her appeal. 
the Ahmadi community still remains besieged and terrorist attacks on Shia Muslims have also not ceased. The day after the dedication of the Abdus Salam Physics Center, which was meant to signal tolerance towards the Ahmadi community, a mob attacked an Ahmadi mosque in Chakwal. And also, the Punjab government's counter-terrorism department itself raided the Ahmadi headquarters, as if to affirm that the government was not softening in relation to the sect. The state of Pakistan's minorities has deteriorated in several stages, and purifying the land of the pure is a short history of that state-supported process of otherization, marginalization, and even attempted elimination of religious minorities, both non-Muslim and Muslim. I demonstrate in my book how different minorities have borne the brunt of state-sanctioned attacks at different times. In Pakistan's early years, Hindus and Sikhs were the major target, while Christians, Ahmadis, and Shias became the focus of hatred in succession. My book begins with a description of the Pakistan I was born in. Let me read you a passage. When Pakistan was born on 14th August 1947, the Azam that day was issued five times on loudspeakers by Shias, Sunnis, and Ahmadis in the new country's capital, Karachi. That call to prayer was echoed outside of mosques too, for Karachi was home to a religiously diverse community. Its architecture reflected this. Along with mosques of various Muslim denominations, there were Catholic and Protestant churches, a Jewish synagogue, Parsi fire temples, as well as Jain and Hindu temples devoted to various deities. Religious holidays were observed openly and often across communities. 67 years later, Karachi is no longer the capital. The country's federal government now conducts its business from a purpose-built capital, Islamabad, whose very name suggests an intrinsic relationship between Pakistan and Islam. Karachi Synagogue was demolished in July 1988, reportedly on the direct orders of General Zia, Pakistan's military dictator at that time, to make way for a shopping mall. The city's last Professed Jew, an 88-year-old woman, died in 2006. Most of his churches have shut down, and the few that remain have a dwindling number of worshippers. Many Pakistani Christians have emigrated to North America or Australia. Most Jain and Hindu temples have either been destroyed or taken over by squatters or land grabbers and property developers. The Parsi population has also declined, though its temples still exist. Walls along the road from Karachi airport to the city are painted with graffiti declaring Shias as kuffar or unbelievers. Shia and non-Muslim families often have armed security guards if they can afford them or avoid a high profile. The Muslim call to prayer no longer sounds from Ahmadi places of worship. The community has been declared non-Muslim through an amendment to the Pakistani constitution. Ahmadis are forbidden by law from describing themselves as Muslims, from using the term mosque for their places of worship, and from issuing the azan before prayers. They risk a stiff jail sentence for violating ordinances that forbid them from any act that might identify them as followers of Islam. My book seeks to analyze Pakistan's policies towards its religious minority populations, Muslim as well as non-Muslim, since independence in 1947. Much of the prejudice against religious minorities can be traced to the effort by Islamist radicals to make Pakistan purer in what they conceive as Islamic terms. Given the denominational differences among various groups of Muslims, this concept of an Islamic state has led to an unending debate over the role of religion in the life of Pakistanis. 
When Pakistan was founded in 1947, its secular founding fathers did not speak of an Islamic state. Muhammad Ali Jinnah recognizes Pakistan's Qaid e Azam great leader clearly declared that non-Muslims would be equal citizens in the new country. Reflecting his secular views, Jinnah himself a Shia, nominated a Hindu, several Shias, and an Ahmadi to Pakistan's first cabinet. Today, non-Muslim representation at the cabinet level is limited to symbolic appointments, while Shias face smear campaigns from extremist Sunni Muslims that declare them non-Muslim. In his famous speech of 11 August 1947, Jinnah had stated that in order to make Pakistan happy and prosperous, every person living in the country, quote, no matter what is his color, caste, or creed, should be first, second, and last a citizen of the state with equal rights, privileges, and obligations. His speech advanced the case for a secular, albeit Muslim-majority, Pakistan. Again, I quote, I cannot emphasize it too much. We should begin to work in that spirit. And in course of time, all these angularities of the majority and minority communities, the Hindu community and the Muslim community, will vanish. The vision outlined by Pakistan's founder remains unfulfilled. As my book demonstrates, there were four stages of intolerance in Pakistan. The first was Muslimization, where you see a massive decline in Hindu and Sikh population between 1947 and 1958. Islamic identity, state-sponsored textbooks rejecting pluralism, and also the loss of East Pakistan, which had a strong Hindu population who had political clout between 1958 and 71. Islamization, the legislation against minorities, 1974 to 88. Militant hostility, terrorism and organized violence, 1988 to the present day. The first phase was marked by the Objectives Resolution of 1949, which was tabled by Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan, Pakistan's first Prime Minister, on March, 12, uh, on March 7, 1949, and passed on March 12, 1949. This resolution has been a part of each and every constitution of Pakistan. The resolution laid the foundations of an Islamic state. Although it promised protection of minority rights, according to Islam, it opened the door for obscurantist interpretations of Islam. The resolution was opposed by the opposition and religious minorities in the Constituent Assembly. Leading members of the Constituent Assembly, like Hussein Shaheed Surabadi, remarked, which was so prescient, a time will come when the state will destroy itself. If Pakistan eliminates non-Muslims from its folds and forms a Muslim state, Islam will be destroyed in Pakistan. The resolution was the first success of the Islamists, like Maulana Shabir Ahmad Usmani and Maulana Abul Ala Modudi, founder of the Jamaat Islami. Modudi sought an Islamic state and was against the creation of Pakistan, but when it, Pakistan came into being, became the leader of the attempt to turn it into an Islamist state. After 1947, Modudi vowed to make Pakistan into an Islamic state, and the Objectives Resolution was the first step in that, step in that direction. According to Modudi, Islam leaves no room of human legislation in an Islamic state. Because herein, all legislative functions vest in God, and the only function left for Muslims lies in their observance of the God-made law. After the partition era violence, the first major religious riots in Pakistan targeted the Ahmadi community in 1953. The riots led to Pakistan's first martial law, which was imposed in Lahore. A commission was set up to inquire into the reasons for these anti-Ahmadi riots. The Munir Commission was also asked Muslim leaders, scholars and Islamist leaders for their views on the treatment of religious minorities. None of these scholars, are we talking about 1953, 
None of these scholars accepted that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights should be the basis of the policy of Pakistan. All clerics were in agreement that non-Muslims could not be given rights equal to those of Muslims. All also insisted that the state must define who is or is not a Muslim, even though none of the clerics could agree with one another on the definition of what made someone a Muslim. By 1953, the insensitivity and treatment of Pakistan's religious minorities by its leaders were clear. Pakistan's first constitution was agreed upon by the Constituent Assembly in 1956. The constitution of 1956 was based upon the Objectives Resolution of 1949. All laws had to conform to Islamic principles and no law could be passed against the Quran and Hadith. Pakistan became the Islamic Republic of Pakistan and the president of the country had to be a Muslim. After that, um, you know, we go into Pakistan's first military dictator, General Ayub Khan, who took power in 1958. Who, and he developed this ideology of Pakistan and played a major role in increasing the role of Pakistan's military in both the political and ideological sphere. In Ayub's eyes, Bengali ethnic aspirations and India were the two biggest challenges facing Pakistan. He conflated the two to create and preach an anti-Hindu worldview. According to Ayub, Bengalis wish to isolate themselves from West Pakistan and revert to Hindu language and culture. Although he professed to be a progressive Muslim, Ayub's anti-Hindu sentiment set off riots in what was then East Pakistan. Rioting and killing of Hindus resulted in about 50,000 Hindus being killed and over 100,000 rendered homeless. Anti-Hindu sentiment was also visible in the Pakistan Army's brutal suppression of Bengalis after Pakistan's first general elections held in December 1970. Two million Bengalis are said to have been killed in the Civil War in 71. Hindus bore the brunt of these attacks, and even in West Pakistan, anti-Hindu sentiment was aroused. The loss of Bangladesh resulted in Zulfikar Ali Bhutto taking over as Pakistan's first civilian democratically elected premier. Bhutto spoke of creating a new Pakistan, a strong Pakistan, and a united one. But in the end, he amended his vision of Pakistan to accommodate the demands of the clerics. Under a new constitution, both the president and prime minister had to be Muslim. The Council of Islamic Ideology was empowered to make legislative recommendations to the parliament to ensure that legislation was in conformity with Islam. The anti ahmadi riots in 74 led to the 1974 anti ahmadi amendment to Pakistan's constitution. By the time the riots ended, 42 people were dead. Numerous Ahmadi mosques had been destroyed, damaged, and their businesses boycotted. With unanimous support from all political parties, on September 7, 1974, Pakistan's National Assembly passed an amendment to the Constitution declaring Ahmadis as non-Muslims. Quote, for the purposes of the constitutional law, the first and only such constitutional amendment in the world in modern times. So Pakistan had changed from 53 when anti ahmadi riots led to identifying perpetrators to the point where 1974 riots resulted in blaming the victims and punishing an entire community by casting them outside the pale of Islam for legal purposes. Bhutto was in power from 71 to 19. 77, and tried to play a balancing act of appeasing diverse groups and ties with Muslim countries, especially of the Muslim Middle East, were deepened. And Bhutto promised to create a chaste Islamic state. I'm now going to shorten my remarks, I think, um, after just two more points. I've touched on the anti ahmadi legislation, um, and now I'd like to talk about the blasphemy laws. However, in 1977, after another military coup, Pakistan's third military dictator, General Zia al Haq, took over. Zia was personally religious and believed that Pakistan and Islam are the names of one and the same thing, 
And any idea or action contrary to this would mean hitting at the very roots of the ideology, solidarity, and integrity of Pakistan. Zia ruled from 77 to 89, and during his time in power, co-opted Islamist parties and passed multiple laws that Islamized Pakistan. The various Islamic laws passed during his time continue to haunt Pakistan to this day. Pakistan has the world's worst blasphemy laws that were imposed in 1982, and according to these laws, blasphemy against Prophet Muhammad is punishable with death or imprisonment for life, while disrespecting the Quran is punishable by life imprisonment. The laws are often used to settle scores, and hundreds of cases targeting religious minorities with blasphemy charges are regularly filed. Pakistani Christians, along with Ahmadis, have borne the brunt of unjust prosecutions under the blasphemy laws. The Ahmadis can be charged for blasphemy for practicing their faith, which they consider to be Islam, because the law forbids them from words or actions that can be construed as pretending to be Muslims. Christians often invite blasphemy charges for refuting Muslim views of Christ as a human messenger of God or denying other elements of the Islamic faith. Pakistan's blasphemy laws make it difficult for religious minorities to practice their religions, creating the prospect of inviting criminal charges for religious beliefs different from that of the majority. Nina Shea, along with Paul Marshall, has written an excellent book, Silenced, How Apostasy and Blasphemy Codes Are Choking Freedom Worldwide. And the book has details of Pakistan's blasphemy laws and their abuse. In effect, Pakistan's blasphemy laws also give Muslim clerics and laity a stick with which to beat Christians and others in the event of non-denominational disputes. For example, there have been instances in which poor Christians have been framed for blasphemy to force them off their land or to punish women for rebuffing proposition from influential men. In recent years, as Islamic terrorists nurtured by the Pakistani state to advance foreign policy objectives have turned inward, attacking Ahmadi Shias and Christians, we see that lethal attacks have been perpetrated against Ahmadi Shias, Christians, Hindus, Sikhs, and people, and Sufis in recent days. Attackers of religious minorities are seldom prosecuted, and if they are, the courts almost invariably set them free. Members of the majority community, the Sunnis, who dare to question state policies about religious exclusion, are just as vulnerable to extremist violence. Most people in the audience will remember the assassination of Punjab Governor Salman Taseer, and also uh, my friend and fellow parliamentarian, Clement Shabazz Bhatti. They were both killed over the issue of blasphemy, wrongfully. Um, when Tafir's murderer was sent to the gallows last year, it was praised as a sign of change in Pakistan. Sadly, a year later, the murderer has been made into a saint by extremists, and his tomb has been converted into a shrine, encouraging others like him to kill in the name of religion. So I will end it here, and um, thank you all for listening, and um, I will come back and Get some water. Thank you. Um, Farah, it's such a, um astonishing feat to be able to, in a very concise way, um, trace these trends, uh, this spiral downwards, if you will, um, in the laws and to some extent the culture as well. And um, again, extremely courageous to do so, to give a critical analysis of, um, of this situation. It's something that we can, in the West, learn from as well. Um, I was struck that recently uh, Denmark, for the, I think the first time in its history, and for the first time since 1947, has, uh, for the first time in its history, has brought a charge of blasphemy for Islam, um, and on behalf of Islam, and for, for, for the first time since 1947, has
brought any charge against blasphemy, uh, for blasphemy, against, you know, for, against any religion. Um, and Canada is also um, passing resolutions um, against Islamophobia, which, like blasphemy, um, is not really defined. Um, so it becomes very expansive, amorphous, mm -hmm. uh, u uh, usable, exploitable uh, against your political opponents and so forth. Now, I think that, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to get your views about what Pakistan's leaders were thinking when they, um, when Zia uh, introduced these harsh penalties and laws, um, and wonder if um, it's the same mentality as these Western places, which seem to think that in the West that it's a way of calming um, the furies of, um, you know, religious zeal, that it's a way to um, stop, to, to calm this, to, 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 toward peace. And looking at Pakistan, whatever the motives were, um, I'd like to know your views about whether it has helped the society at all or, or what it's, it seems to have been just the opposite. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that. And, you know, it's something that I was thinking about a lot as, as an, an, an addressed, actually, with Paul in our book, Silenced. Um, and uh, so that's very much in my mind. Nina, firstly, I mean, just to be very clear, um, I believe very strongly that uh, religion has no place in the political sphere in terms of lawmaking of the kind that we've talked about, like the blasphemy laws, etc. That the state itself has to be fair to every citizen equally. And that has to be whether it is against minority or majority members of that state. You cannot have laws and the state bullying mm -hmm. and persecuting members of society. Now, what you were referring to about um, these recent moves towards um, uh, using the blasphemy law, for example, in Europe, etc. cetera, um, I will just talk about from the Pakistani experience that Mr. Jinnah had talked about no matter what your caste or creed, mm -hmm. in the eyes of the law, you are Pakistani first, mm -hmm. right? But from the first prime minister, then to Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and the anti ahmadi laws, to Zia al haq and the blasphemy laws, you see in Pakistan whether it is a civilian or military uh, government, each and every single one appeased the clerics to increase the government and the ruler's own power. And they also did think, like I do believe, that Mr. Bhutto, for example, if you look at the anti ahmadi laws, he was, um, he, the PPP, one of their biggest backers was the Ahmadi community. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Bhutto believed, I'll pass this law, and you know, he had privately assured the head of the Ahmadi community, you know, later it's politics, it'll be reversed. And that is sort of the drip, drip, drip that is wearing away at true religious freedom. So he may not even have been conscious of where he was going with it or what it was going to end was, up. He was, he was personally trying to liberal, day by day. secular, but in terms of at the end of the day, he wanted to empower himself, and it came to dealing with those very same mm. clerics. So it started with that. Zia was, of course, a true believer. Mm -hmm. I and think you call the Bucha chapter uh, balancing act. Yes. yes. So then we so, move on to Islamization. Yes. It's, it's so very now, deliberate. Zia's was project. Mm -hmm. It was sort of the institutionalization mm -hmm. of not Islam, but political Islamization. Mm -hmm. He had no room for Ahmadis. He had no room for Shias. He, you know, looked at Christians and Hindus in Pakistan as sort of by the by. They were not a serious they were not even contenders in his eyes, as from the quote I read of being serious Pakistani. So appeasement 
for what is happening in the society right now mm-hmm. is not necessarily easy to reverse so whatever law making is to be done has i mean i believe there should be no laws of this kind i believe there are other venues within society where you take up these issues and i believe that's where civil rights groups exist i believe that religious freedoms groups exist i believe universities there are many forums for this but it's a very very dangerous path i call what's happened in pakistan a trip trip genocide mm. you don't see it happening you don't see it coming right it's in pieces but by the time you see it Ismail. you're sitting it's almost too late to reverse um the you you make it clear that uh zia ohaks uh reign was or re- regime was um the maybe the the darkest point where he started institutionalizing these measures that were so discriminatory and um sl- you know uh designed to really mm-hmm. suppress the minorities uh it's, it's been um what 30 years since 35 years mm-hmm. uh since the end of his uh government and have you seen um any reverse at all in any area i mean and and you know what is left of this sort of mixed hybrid that was then created what are the bright spots <laughs> the bright spots have been that you do see in civil society and among younger people you know uh, uh, an attempt to understand and read about why did i write this book this book was written so that young students in universities in pakistan also right would be able to access the facts not the narrative fed to them through these doctored school books mm-hmm. these school books which are full of hate speech against religious minorities which sell this ideology of pakistan basically where the military and allah are you know omnipresent and india is the perennial enemy this is not what you should be teaching children you should be teaching them physics and that was by uh, zio Th- those were introduced by zio well it started oh, with, yes with the us this is a time when the us was supporting him yes Heavily. but also um ayub khan actually started the anti hindu in in the pakistani textbooks it was ayub jan all the way back to ayub that the project of shaping society mm-hmm. started um but as you know as we've talked about you start you know you you start with the most visible and then now within the islamic fabric of pakistan things are mm-hmm. falling apart mm-hmm. who is a muslim in pakistan shias are not muslims and ahmadis are not muslims and many others you know sex are no longer muslim so it's become an uglier and uglier thing so it, after the yeah, i would say there have been there have been those bright spots in terms of you do see people stand up in civil society you see these groups but then very often you see them gun down mm-hmm. yeah. sabin mahmood who was a secular rights um uh and a worker and a great feminist in pakistan in karachi uh ranjas speech for free speech and thought was murdered by a jihadi before that salman tasir before that it's endless people keep standing up this is what i think is so great mm-hmm. about the people but the sheer force of numbers yeah many um human rights activists and lawyers i know have been gone yes. down Yeah, they're the defense of of they're the, dead. of the and blasphemy victims they did and so even though you had people like prime minister benazi bhutto when she came in she really did want to for example do away with the hudood ordinances of uh, zia ul haq which affected women in you know in terrible ways from court, in, in the court of law etc but within minutes they had her government spinning and out the door 
It was a lesson learned. Lesson learned. Well, I'd like to open up to any questions we might have from the audience. And please wait for the microphone and identify yourself. Should we start in the back? Hi, my name is Mary Carrick. I know two different men who grew up in Pakistan, and both of them have said that this radicalization is really due to Saudi Arabia building these Islamic centers and funding these mosques and writing these materials, like the book she mentioned. Has, has that been your observation, and when did they start doing this? Because I'd read reports that this was actually happening in the United States, even like 20 years ago, and elsewhere throughout the Muslim world, except for Iran. I see many heads um, nodding here, but I do have to say something. If you, had, if you listen to anything of what I said, um, the Saudi influence came in during Zia al Haq. It was during the time of the Afghan war, the Mujahideen, and the United States and Saudi Arabia were very involved in Pakistan and in supporting Pakistan building up these militias to fight in Afghanistan. But um, unfortunately, those militias came back during Zia's time to kill Pakistani Shias. And um, yes, the Saudis funded madrasas all over Pakistan. Yes, they've had a pernicious effect. But if you heard me, I spoke about Pakistan's first prime minister and the objectives resolution in 19, you know, we start with 1949, 1952, this is way before the Saudis came in the 80s. So you can't blame. I have to say, people and countries have to look within. You have to look within. That's the reason for this book. You have to read the history, no matter what your feeling is. I am no less of a proud daughter of Pakistan than anyone else who thinks that they're a great patriot just because I live in fact, because the only way you can combat and change and save Pakistan is by knowing the facts and finding ways forward. So yes, the Saudis have had a very pernicious effect, but they came in the 80s, and all of this started within the first year of Pakistan coming after Mr. Jinnah's death. So in other words, you're saying that, that Pakistan has to take responsibility for itself and it has agency. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know... I, Saudi Arabia may not have helped. <laughs> no, they absolutely did not help. I'm not trying to say they, you know, but I'm just saying all societies have to do the job within. Who let them in? Mm -hmm. It was Pakistanis. Mm -hmm. You know, who supported that military? It has to, you know, one has to, one has to be tough on oneself. You know, one of the bright spots I was just thinking as, as uh, just popped in my mind was um, Malala. An example of your civil society or civic society, people, a young gal who uh, won the Nobel Prize for um, advocating women's education, a girls' education, despite being shot through the head. But she was shot through the head. Mm -hmm. We forget the fact that for trying to get that education and the amount of, she spun in Pakistan in some circles as being a CIA spy. Yeah. So, it you know, in that whole conspiracy, no, they are great human beings. That country never stops surprising. That's why I think if there is going to be a way forward, mm -hmm. you know, it is, it is, and through the women, I would say more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just the way. <laughs> okay, uh, let me do this row. Again, can you please identify yourself? Of course, Mahmoud Ahmad, I'm with the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Uh, I wanted to add something to, I think, what you had described, which is also that in Pakistan now, access to rights of citizenship is limited by, by virtue of religion. Um, for example, if you want a passport or if you want to register to vote, you have to declare that you are uh, what religion you are. And if you want to be able to be call yourself Muslim, you have to den denounce the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in fairly uh, vile terms. But so, so with that said, I guess one question I have is you paint a fairly bleak picture and yet there are these glimmers of hope. Where, where does one start in what I think most people would agree is a generational project, which is reversing these uh, dangerous trends? And so pivoting back to citizenship, is that a place to start? Uh, for example, Pakistan has elections coming up next year. 
would, would it be productive, in your view, for civil society actors and governments to ask Pakistan to uphold its obligations under international law and provide equal access to the voting booth, irrespective of religion? I, no, I, I, I'll tell you why I think differently. And members of your Jamaat see it. This is sort of one of the things that they've been wanting. Voting rights, because once Ahmadis were deemed non-Muslim, they couldn't vote as Muslims, right? So, because they were put in this minority, so they never wanted to vote, because it was basically announcing and accepting that they were not Muslim. Right now, the whole thing, the whole situation is very tense. It's very important, I think, for the for Ahmadis to go to the polls, because in certain districts within Punjab, which is all important, your votes could make a difference. But what they're doing in Pakistan, because you have to say your religion and your address and all of that, it will put the Ahmadi voter at huge risk. So the desire is to have voting lists which do not list a religion, which is very, very fair. And that is something which is doable. And I think that not just the Ahmadiyya community, I think anyone in the world, Pakistan calls itself a democratic state. If it is a democratic state, each and every person should be able to go to the polls and cast their vote with no identifying markers of their religion, their address, or any of these kinds of things. So I think that's a very, very important, that's the way forward, I, I think, I truly believe. You made a point in your book that was uh, something I hadn't thought about too much before. It was that uh, the sectarian voter, you know, communal voting lists where you vote Mm -hmm. according to religion for your religious candidates, was also a way to deprive votes for the people's, uh, Pakistan People's Party, you know, for the more yes. moderate or more uh, uh. modern party um, that believed in some kind of separation of mosque and state. Uh, they would get the votes of some of the minorities as right. well as liberal Muslims, and that was a way to shut out those votes for them. That, so that, it would help. That, yeah. It would help, you know, democracy too. Oh, you know, the democratic it, process, I should say, yes, as well. Absolutely, would strengthen it. Yeah, it would strengthen the voices of people who need to be heard. Yeah, that's a good. That's voice. a good um, perform. Um, anything on this side? Any questions on this side? All on this side. <laughs> oh, here's one on this side. Why don't we move on to? Sammy Gervis. Um, I would like to ask you actually about, you said that there is a gradual genocide. And this is very clear from the numbers that you said. It started with 25% religious minority, now they are 3%. Do you think that what happened exactly? Did they expose to forced displacement or they left the country or they forced it to convert? And what happened? To all, have this. all of those. They're, but but they're, it seems that, because we haven't seen that many of diaspora who are Christian, for example, or Hindu from Indian, but see from Pakistan, it seems that just something happened in a massive sphere. Do you think that it was forced conversion for certain time? We had to had to convert to Islam. We had to like classifies himself with another religion, even if they don't have to convert? I, I think what I understood your question, and I would say in Pakistan, it's been, it's been all of those things. Um, with the Christian and Hindu communities in particular, forced conversions, and especially the forced conversions of the Hindu, in, within the Hindu community by Muslims of young Hindu girls, um, has been a huge project, a problem in, in recent years, and I would say a project. And um, so you have forced conversion, you have laws, you have, you've had two wars, um, well, the 1947 partition plus the 1971 East and West Pakistan becoming Bangladesh, where again we lost 
a huge chunk of the Hindu population. So for each, the Ahmadiyyas, the persecution, making them a non-Muslim, creating them as a non-Muslim sect. Um, they have been very different. My book is short, but I lay all of these different. It's not one thing. And that's why I say that everyone has to be so vigilant because it's, n it's never one exact. If, are you from Egypt? So, I mean, uh, in fact, I don't, uh, there's my husband. He was saying, I think earlier, something like during the Ottoman Empire, 20% non-Muslim, is that correct? And today, for example, like the area like where Egypt is, 8%. And in the rest of the Middle East, 1% to 2% Christian. So you see that now, I mean, when I wrote this book, we hadn't really seen what was going to happen in the Middle East happen when I was researching in the way. But it's a disease. It's a disease. Hi. We have a lot of questions. We don't have much time. I so think we have... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, OK. Thank you, Farnaza, for your enlightening book and um, this presentation. You mentioned Bangladesh and that uh, that it's separated from what is uh, from then West Pakistan. But um, if you look at the statistics of Bangladesh, it's also religious minorities have decreased since its independence in 1971 from, I think, the high 20s to now less than 10%. And you have radicalization bloggers being killed. Is there a single source of radicalization but happening in both Pakistan and Bangladesh when you have very similar um, societal issues taking place or is it or are they s separate or are they unique to each country? Could you elaborate on that based on your experience in the region as a whole? Um, what I could say about Bangladesh again and um, if you look at India, you look at Sri Lanka today and the Buddhists, um, uh, you see the same majoritarian culture rearing its head. And um, I, so this has become now a global disease, which is what I started to say. And um, in Bangladesh in particular, I think what we would uh, probably say is it's the same appeasement. There has been an appeasement, no matter how secular the government has come across publicly. Um, the secular bloggers seem to end up dead, but the extremist fundamentalists do not. And in Pakistan also, um, one of the things I do have to stress, the justice system is always against the person who's been accused of blasphemy, the person who's been murdered, by the extremists, the justice system tends to stand up for the murderer or the extreme extreme element. So that's that's also a fundamental issue. Um, let's have uh, let's take these uh, three questions real quickly. Maybe you could ask them all at the same mm -hmm. time, since we're really out of time. Just identify yourself and ask your question. And so if also a freelance writer, um, one of the um, minorities in Pakistan that has not been talked about much has been the Dalit community. Um, a lot of the segregation of schools, the lack of access to water wells. Um, why has the Pakistani government been silent on more equality for such a small, marginalized population of these Dalits? And how can they play a more active role in improving um, their equality in Pakistan? Um, uh, Jay? Jay Kansaras here from the Hindu American Foundation. Do you have any, can you shed some light on the Dalit situation? So we host uh, representatives of the Pakistani Hindu community here in the United States, and we and we actually had just two of them coming on a speaking tour this oh, in December. And they were mentioning that the so number one, in the census of the government of Pakistan, the Dalit community, which by and large is primarily Hindu, they don't classify them as Hindu, and they therefore try and separate them from the Hindu community for census purposes because they don't want to provide the Hindu community with additional minority seats, which they would be entitled to based on the current makeup of the parliament. 
Also, there there is a an attempt by the mullahs and others to target them for conversion based on their marginalized situation. So th that's coming directly from those who are from the scheduled tribe, caste, and Dalit communities in Pakistan. That's direct information that we've heard. So um, unfortunately, I would say that's probably why the government of Pakistan is not too keen on assisting them in their dire situation because they are appeasing the, the likes of jamaat e islami and, and other groups to for their targeting of them for conversion. Thanks for that. Uh, we have to keep hope alive, so I, my question is, do you really see a moderate leader emerging within Pakistan who can somehow be acceptable to the larger community and who can control not only the uh, clerics but also characters like Hafiz Saeed and uh, Mazur Asad and so on and so forth? I had great hope about Imran Khan at one time, but he has greatly disappointed me. So do you see some moderate leader emerging? You know, this, this search I find actually in America constantly this one great leader, this one great white hope is very sad. You have to support more than one person. General Parvez Musharraf was the darling of Washington DC. Um, you know, he was a military dictator. He became supposedly a civilian ruler. He was there for a decade. He had all the power in the world. Why didn't he do it? Why? Why? Because deep down, there must be some... So um, it's, it's, not, it's never going to be one of those people. The people who have to be empowered are all those people on the ground, and there are lots of people in lots of organizations. And you have to stop selling uh, arms and empowering Pakistani army. Empower the people of Pakistan. The Stan has picked the wrong ally. If you want the Pakistani people, that's a different ally. You want to help every Pakistani citizen, especially the Pakistani minorities, because they are in unimaginable com conditions. So start working on Congress, writing, get involved. Um, one last very final one. I'm Mohinder Gulati. Um, intrigued by your uh, use of phrase, uh, drip, drip, genocide. In 1973, as you said, uh, in 1973, in East Pakistan, 50,000 Hindus were killed. 74, 75, before uh, it became Bangladesh, 2 million Bengalis were killed by the Pakistan army. Uh, more than a million women were raped. Uh, it doesn't sound like a drip, drip genocide to me. My question is somewhat different. This happened over a period of 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. During those 40 years, what is it that the international community was doing? The United Nations representative in Pakistan, did he send dispatches to the headquarters saying this is what is happening in the country? The US ambassador sitting in Pakistan, did he send dispatches to your say that this is what is happening? Your question is, sir. Yeah, that's yes, the question I'm asking in your podium, research. What you just talked about, from the podium I addressed those questions of what happened with the Hindu community in um, East, when it was East Pakistan. I addressed those and I used the same numbers you did. Um, it's not my job to talk to, about the UN representative or whatever. What it is my job to say is today, the United States Commission for International Religious Freedom every year for years has asked the State Department to declare Pakistan as a country of the gravest concern, is like the particular. country of particular concern. And year after year, the State Department has shelved that. Again, who do they care about? Is it the people of Pakistan? Obviously not. And Yusuf is an autonomous body because of its alliance and friendship and deep ties with Pakistan. So ask Congress, ask state, ask all the people who, sit, who are answerable to every American taxpayer. 
Exactly. That's my question. It's the conspiracy of silence, not only in Pakistan, Absolutely. but the conspiracy of silence Absolutely. of the international community and I agree with as you. well. Yeah. I agree with you. Well, thank you very much, Farah. Um, I, I'm going to uh, close by quoting from our friend Leon Wieseltier, who blurbed your book. And he says that if Pakistan is ever to recover from its descent into extremism and violence, it will require the humane spirit exemplified by this book. Exactly. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much.